So this is problem number two. It's from the 2019 AP Calc AB free response set. It's a calculator question. And if you look at this table real fast that we're provided with, uh, V sub P of T measured in meters per hour kind of implies we're looking at velocity values across the bottom row of this table. And those velocity values are measured at various moments in time. Uh, we don't have a consistent delta T in the table, so that's something we'll probably have to pay attention to a little bit later on within the pieces of this. But the rest of the setup tells us that the velocity of particle P, uh, which is moving along the x-axis, is given by the differentiable function V sub P. We've got these values of V of P up in the table here. And we're told that particle P is at the origin at time zero. Part A asks us to justify why there must be at least one time in the interval 0.3 to 2.8, at which V prime of T, which represents the acceleration of the particle, equals zero meters per hour per hour. So I read that and, and right away I thought mean value theorem. And what kind of triggered that is we have values of velocity and we're trying to guarantee the existence of a value of velocity's derivative. And that's exactly what the conclusion of the mean value theorem se says. Now, to use one of these theorems, you have to give yourself the green light in order to proceed with it. And the mean value theorem has two things within the hypothesis that need to be true. So what they tell us in the problem statement here is they tell us that V of P is differentiable. And since V of P is differentiable, it's got to be continuous. Right? If it's differentiable, that implies that it's continuous. And it, we're flat out told that it's differentiable. So the, the two things within the hypothesis of the mean value theorem that give you the green light to go ahead and proceed with it are continuity on the closed interval that you're trying to apply it, apply it over, and then differentiability on the open interval that you're trying to apply it over. It's technically differentiable, including those endpoints as well. The conclusion of the theorem says that your average rate of change, which is just a regular old slope calculation applied to the function that you're dealing with. So a slope calculation with the velocity values at 2.8 and 0 0.3. So a slope calculation with this ordered pair and this ordered pair uh, is going to end up giving me a value of zero, right? Because the function values, the velocity values at each of those times are equal to each other. Units are meters per hour per hour, so that kind of matches up with the units of acceleration that we would expect and that are specified within part A here. Conclusion, well, by the mean value theorem, V prime of C, the acceleration of particle P, has to equal zero at least once for some C in between 0.3 and 2.8. Part B asks us to use a trapezoidal sum. The subintervals for the sum are indicated within the table. So we've got one subinterval going from 0 to 0 0.3, a second subinterval from 0.3 to 1.7, and then a final subinterval from 1.7 to 2.8. So I, before I did anything else, just kind of noticed what my change in time was on each of those. 0.3 for the first subinterval, 1.4 for the next, and then 1.1 for the last. I wanted to do a trapezoidal sum, so I did need to recognize that the area of a trapezoid is the average of the parallel sides, which are typically called the bases, times the distance between them, which is typically called the height. And I was doing that trapezoidal sum to approximate this integral. So this definite integral's value is approximated by the average of the y values on the interval 0 to 0 0.3. So average of those y values times the distance between those parallel sides. I'm adding on to that the average of these two y values or these two velocity values times the distance between them. I'm adding on to that the average of these two velocity values times the distance between them. As long as everything got into the calculator appropriately here, I ended up with 40.75 for the approximation for that integral with that trapezoidal sum. Part C introduces a new particle, so particle Q is also moving on the x-axis. Its velocity on the interval 0, 4 is given by this function. Also measured in meters per hour, so no unit conversion necessary to make comparisons between P and Q. We want to find the time interval during which the velocity of particle Q is at least 60 meters per hour. Now that I reread this question, I don't know that I necessarily explicitly stated that. So my 
my work on the screen here is off a little bit. We'll talk about how to modify it in a few seconds. And then it goes on to say, find the distance traveled by particle Q during the interval when the velocity of particle Q is at least 60 miles per hour, 60 meters per hour, excuse me. So right away, I, I, I read this sentence right here. Find the time interval during which the velocity of particle Q is at least 60 meters per hour. I realized I could graph this velocity function. That's the graph that you see here. And I realized I could graph y equals 60. So I graphed those two things, and I saw on this stretch of the graph, my velocity function is definitely above 60. So I, I found the intersection between V sub Q of T and 60. Uh, I labeled the first intersection as A. I, carried, I took all the digits of accuracy that the calculator provided me with here because I realized I was going to do another computation with that number to answer the follow-up part in part C here. And then I also found the intersection over here. And once again, I'm defining that as part as point B along the x-axis. And I did carry all the digits of accuracy that the calculator provided me with, just so I don't incur any round off there. To satisfy this set of directions, find the time interval during which the velocity of particle Q is at least 60 miles per hour, I would have wanted to write an inequality velocity of particle Q is at least 60 miles per hour from 1.866 up until 3.519. So I don't have the best work here based on rereading the problem as I'm putting the commentary in. Uh, so you'd want to make sure you get that written out within your solution. I do have another part of this to talk about and it's to find the distance traveled by particle Q during this interval. So I'm going to have to integrate my velocity function to figure out the distance that I've covered across the time frame from 1.866 up until 3.519. I just represented those limits of integration as A and B since I clearly defined A and B over here uh, on the left-hand portion of my screen. I did this integral on the calculator and I ended up with 106.109 meters as the total distance traveled from time A to time B. One thing that you don't have to worry about here is you don't have to worry about absolute values around your velocity function. When you're doing a total distance calculation, you would need to worry about that. But this velocity function is above 60 for that entire stretch. So it's clearly above zero. We don't have any negative velocities to worry about within that interval. So the absolute values weren't necessary in this particular case. And then the last part of the problem says that at time zero, particle Q is at x equals negative 90. Use that result from part B, so that was that trapezoidal sum, and the function V sub Q from part C to approximate the distance between these two particles at time 2.8. So back in part B, we had the integral of V sub P of T from 0 to 2.8 approximated by 40.75. If we want to know the position of particle Q at time 2.8, we have to take into account its starting position at time 0 and add on how much the position changes by from 0 up until 2.8 by integrating the rate of change of position, integrating the velocity function. That's a calculation you can do on the calculator. So you see I, I input this on this first line right here. So x sub q of 2.8 is approximately 45.938, if you're rounding that to three digits of accuracy. That's not really what the question was, though. The question was, what's the approximate distance between them? So I left that accurate on my calculator to all of the digits that it provided me with and then I subtracted the position of particle P from it. Um, we care about the distance between them. We aren't asked to judge whether or not particle P is to the right or particle Q is to the left or anything like that. So we just care about the magnitude or the absolute value of the distance between those two particles and that ends up being 5.188 which I did take to the standard three digits of accuracy that the College Board requires.